Many of the most beautiful objects in the night sky, like distant spiral galaxies or nebula, are also the faintest and hardest to see. Yet astrophotographers are able to capture their faint light with cameras and reveal the full wonder of the night sky. In BBC Sky at Night magazine's three-part online masterclass series, hosted by our editor Chris Bramley, we'll take a look at three key areas of deep sky imaging. On the 29th of September, we'll tell you how you can get started in deep sky imaging. Then on the 26th of October, we'll explain how you can deal with some of the impact of light pollution. Then finally, on the 30th of November, we'll tell you how you can create deep sky mosaics of larger areas. You can either watch along live or review the on-demand recordings after the event. Visit skyatnightmagazine.com and click on virtual events to book your tickets now for all three classes and save 20%. Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the print edition of the magazine by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com or to our digital edition by visiting iTunes or Google Play. Greetings listeners and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in BST. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 23rd to the 29th of October. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined by reviews editor Paul Money. Hello, Paul. Hello, Ezzy. So what have we got to look forward to this week? Well, we have to start in the morning sky. I know we've got to start somewhere, haven't we? Mm -hmm. But if you like to be up in the morning, if you take the dog for an early morning walk sort of thing, have a go at six o'clock in the morning. Venus will be well up in the sky. Twilight will just about be beginning, but it'll still be reasonably dark. And the reason I mention it is Venus reaches greatest western elongation from the sun. It's shining at magnitude minus 4.4. Other than the moon and the sun, it is the brightest object in the actual sky and it lies now 46 degrees away from the sun and this is why we can see it for several hours in a dark sky it's so far away from the glare of the sun we can actually observe it for at length as one might say <laughs> observing venus and uh, you can't mistake it it's such a brilliant object and of course this is why it gets the name of the not just the evening star the morning star as well. And mm. as we mentioned last week, it's still worth trying to catch the uh, shadow cast by Venus um, by, whilst it's before the twilight starts. So we've still got a period of time when we can actually do it before the moon gets up and gets in the way and actually stops it and before Venus gradually drops back down towards the solar glare. But we've got Venus for a little while yet, I have to say, so, so we can enjoy it. Now, similar on the same day in the evening sky, Look for the moon to the lower right of Saturn. This is when we start to have that period where we have the moon getting in the way and getting involved with the planets. And so Saturn is the first one it interacts with. It's to the lower right of Saturn on the evening of the 23rd, around about eight o'clock. The moon is a day past first quarter. So it look a little bit like a half phase, slightly fatter half phase moon, in fact. The next evening, on the 24th, the moon lies to the left of Saturn, actually almost level and a little bit closer the night before. And uh, again, look around about eight o'clock to actually catch one of the best views before it actually gets too low uh, in the sky. Now, that was the 24th then. The 25th, of course, the moon doesn't stay still. <laughs> it's constantly moving, isn't it? And it's nice when the planets are reasonably close together because then you get a succession of events. So on the 25th, the moon is actually to the lower right of Neptune. Now, yes, I know it's a gibbous moon, so it's quite getting, you know, quite thick. Uh, there's a lot of light from that, but you should be able to find Neptune in binoculars and a small telescope. And I particularly like this region of sky. Neptune has just crept into Pisces, according to the International Astronomical Union's borders as such. They decided the borders these. So they, they stuck to the right, lines of right ascension and declination rather than the shapes of the actual figures, the mythological figures themselves. So Neptune's mm. just over the border in Pisces. The moon will be in Aquarius. 
And as it happens, if you go from Neptune to the moon and slightly back up a little bit, you get a trio of stars. And I always like these little trio of stars. They're Psi 1, 2, and 3 Aquarii sort of thing. So there we are. And they're about a similar magnitude, around about magnitude 4 to 4.5. So they're very similar brightness, each one. I just happen to like little groupings like that sort of thing, you know. So they're not a true cluster, but they're quite pleasing to the eye, if you ask me. So that's Psi mm -hmm. 1, 2, and 3 Aquarii. And they're almost less level actually with the moon so as it rising about eight o'clock in the evening now we have to go a couple of days before we get our next major event but it is a good one Ooh, normally good. we're not that bothered with full moon are we i mean full moon i mean we get these super moons uh but it's full moon on the 28th and the good news is we get a partial eclipse of the moon and it's quite a reasonable one the pen umbra will cover the entire moon itself and then we'll get the umbra the darkest part of the earth's shadow just cutting the southern hemisphere of the moon putting on a great display for us yes we probably should explain for anybody who isn't familiar with the terminology surrounding lunar eclipses there's sort of two shadows so you have the umbra, which is the complete shadow that is where the sunlight is being blocked by Earth from hitting the moon. And that does tend to have a slightly red hue because what happens is some of Earth's atmosphere scatters some of the red light into that region and we see it as, as a red shadow. But there's also the penumbra, which is a slightly lighter shadow around it. It's not quite as dark. It doesn't have that red coloration, which is part of the, the Earth's shadow that the moon passes through as well. So in this case, it's just going to be going mainly through the penumbra with slightly clipping the umbra. Uh, it's only a total if the entire disk of the moon goes into that umbral section. So the penumbral phase, that very light shading of the moon, begins at a minute past seven in the evening. The umbral phase starts at about 8.35 p.m. Mid-eclipse, when it when the most of the umbra is actually on, which is a, quite a partial this time, is at 14 minutes past nine. And then the end of the umbral phase is just before 10 o'clock at 9.53. And finally, the penumbra, which is very light, so it, you, you, you have mm. to take a bit of care to notice it because it's quite subtle that finally finishes at 11:26 but i mean it's nice to have an eclipse and let's just hope we do have some clear skies for this sort of thing because i've been missing eclipses as a i've been i've i've not <laughs> seen anything for a while mainly because of cloud etc so you know fingers crossed for this one october the 28th now as it happens october the 28th the moon has to be to the upper right of Jupiter. So you've not just got a partially eclipsed moon, which will look a bit odd with a bite taken out of it in a sense. You've also got Jupiter to its lower left as such. So there we are. And during the course of the night, the moon creeps closer to Jupiter as well as an extra bonus. Now, finally, what we get is the end on the 29th of October. In the early morning, we have the end of British summertime. Gosh, that, that's flown quick. You know, but of course I'm happy because we're back on GMT real time. <laughs> <laughs> but as we had the moon the previous night close to Jupiter, on the evening of the 29th, it's actually above, well, to the upper right of Uranus. Now, it's just past full. So to be fair, there's a lot of light there. But again, binoculars should show uh, Uranus as well. And then we've got the Pleiades. Now, the Pleiades will be washed out and they're to the left of both of them. But back finally to the moon, this is a good time to see the ray features. It's not very good for seeing crater detail because the light from the sun is straight down. It's full on, hence full moon. So it's hitting the surface full on. But... The ray features like Tycho and Copernicus, etc., actually show up really well a few days either side of full. So this is a great chance to actually study the ray patterns actually on the moon. These tend to be associated with the streaks of relatively recent craters, and it's the splatter of the material out that is, tends to be quite reflective and shows up with these wonderful streaks. So uh, there we are, finished by looking at the... I don't normally do this. I'm a deep sky observer, and I'm saying finished by looking at the full moon. 
But there are <laughs> reasons and there are decent features to see on the moon. And of course, you've got the Mario and the man on the moon, the face of the moon. Hey, I think we should change that. It no longer should be man on the moon, you know. I think we should say person on the moon, don't you? Mm, well, there's lots of different uh, mythologies around the world that see different deities and people. I know the Chinese uh, mythology, it was a princess with her jade rabbit a companion because that's what the Chinese the, the rovers are named after. They're named jade rabbit after that particular myth. So there's lots of different things that people can see in the moon. But thank you for taking us through all of that, Paul. If anybody at home would like to make sure that you get even more stargazing highlights, please do remember to subscribe to the podcast. But to summarise those, on the 23rd of October, Venus will be well up in the morning sky and visible for several hours. So a good chance to get a look at that one. And on the 23rd, it's the beginning of a chance to see the moon passing by all of the gas giants or the giant planets of our solar system. It begins on the 23rd and 24th when it passes by Saturn. On the 25th, the moon will pass by Neptune. Then jumping forward to the 28th, it will pass by the upper right of Jupiter. And on that same night, you will also have the chance to see a partial eclipse of the moon as it's passing by Jupiter on the 28th. And then on the 29th, the moon will be going past Uranus. It will also be a great opportunity to see the ray features on the moon as it is almost full on that date. And of course, on the 29th of October, it's a date to put in your diary because that is when the clocks will be changing. we the end of BST and we'll be moving forward into GMT. We want to make sure that you don't miss any of these events in the night sky because you're looking up at the wrong time. But we hope to see you here next week. And from all of us here at Sky at Night magazine and Star Diary podcast, goodbye. Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the print edition of the magazine by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com or to our digital edition by visiting iTunes or Google Play. 